Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I love you too. Thank you very much. <laughs> So touched and so blessed to be with you tonight. You honor me with your presence. Thank you for taking the time to coming here tonight and filling this beautiful church and, and just being inspired and being surrounded with love, with energy, with goodness. You know, people ask me all the time, Brigitte, don't you get depressed talking about radical Islam and terrorism and such a downer subject? And I tell them, you know what? Yes, I do. But you know what lifts my spirit up when I am down? Is this energy that I reflect on. And I remember all the places that I go to and I speak to. And the people that I meet across the way. Like the wonderful people like you that I'm going to get a chance to shake your hand tonight. And, and be around you and talk with you. And I say, there are great people in this world. There are great people in this country who share my passion for the United States. For its security. For Israel and its protection so I am delighted to be surrounded with you tonight and share with you um, my life story what's happening in our country and what drives me to travel the nation and also the world to speak about why we all need to stand up and come together and call evil by its name I hope you will be inspired, you will be empowered, you will be encouraged, you will be enthusiastic to go out and change the world because it doesn't take many people to change the world. It only takes a dedicated few. So here we are tonight. I'm going to share with you why I am so passionate about the issue of national security. And I'm going to share with you my life story. For those of you who do not know much about me, and this is the first night um, you hear anything uh, from me. I come from Lebanon. I was born and raised in Lebanon, which used to be the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. We were open-minded, we were fair, we were tolerant, we were multicultural. We prided ourselves on our multiculturalism. We had open border policy, we welcomed everyone to come to our country because we wanted to share with them the westernization which we had created in the heart of the Arabic world. Muslims used to send their children to study in our universities because we had built the best universities in the Arabic world. They graduated and worked in our economy because we had built the best economy economy in the Middle East, even though we did not have any oil. Beirut became Paris of the Middle East, the banking capital of the Middle East. In 1965, National Geographic magazine had on its front cover, Lebanon, Eden of the Middle East. Unfortunately, all this began to change as the years went by. See, we got our independence in the early 40s. But by the 60s and 70s, the Christians had become the minority and the Muslims had become the majority in Lebanon. And as the Islamic um, population grew in the country, the country became less and less tolerant because they started pushing for more rights that were not compatible with our, with our Judeo-Christian value system that we had created. And that's when the problem started. The problem was contained until the influx of the Palestinians out of Jordan in 1970 when Lebanon brought them in because we already had refugee camps. Actually, at that time, Lebanon was the only country in the Middle East to accept the third wave of Palestinians into Lebanon. The majority of them were Muslims. They put their heads together with the Muslims in Lebanon and declared jihad on the Christians. What they wanted to do is create a base from which to fight Israel, kill the Jews, and throw them into the sea. Something they tried to do in Jordan. Yes, Arafat and the Palestinians tried to do in Jordan, but they failed because of the dictatorship of the king. Yet they were able to come to Lebanon, use our open-mindedness, our fairness, our tolerance, our multiculturalism, and our democracy to topple our democracy. My 9-11 happened to me in 1975 when, that, when radical Muslims blew up my home, bringing it down, burying me under the rubble wounded as they shouted Allahu Akbar. My only crime was that I was a Christian living in a Christian town. I ended up in a hospital for two and a half months. And as I laid in a hospital bed, hooked up to IVs in both arms, I would ask my parents, 
Why did they do this to us? Why did they attack us? And my father would tell me, because we are Christians, the Muslims consider us infidels and they want to kill us. So I knew since I was a 10-year-old child that I am wanted dead simply because I was born into the Christian faith and lived in a Christian town. This is something so foreign to Christians in America. Because in America, our idea of persecution is, oh, I took my Bible with me to work today and people looked at me funny. <laughs> That's our idea of persecution. Where I come from, our idea of persecution is they want to walk into this church and start shooting at you and killing you. Just like what they're doing in Iraq right now. Just like what they're doing in Egypt right now. Just like what they're doing in Syria. Just like what they did in Lebanon. Actually, what launched the all-out war in Lebanon was four Muslims walked into a church service on a Sunday morning just like this and started shooting at people. That's what started the Lebanese civil war. I ended up leaving the hospital and coming back home. But my home was no longer the home I left. I ended up living with my parents underground in an 8 by 10 bomb shelter without any electricity, any water, and very little food. To get some food, we would crawl out under the bombs and we would dig out different dandelions and different vegetation and different greenery that grew around our bomb shelter because it was the only greenery we had. To get some water, we would crawl to a nearby spring in a ditch surrounded by snipers trying to shoot at us just to get a drink of water. And before we left our bomb shelter, my mother and I and my father would say our last goodbyes because we did not know if we're going to come back alive or dead just to get a drink of water. And we would crawl in a ditch to what used to take a five-minute walk would take us hours to get to the spring where my mother had to use her stocking on top of the gallon of water to catch all the worms and all the junk and all the dirt and all the rocks so we can drink the water. And this became my existence. We lived in the mountains. In the wintertime, it was so cold. And because we didn't have electricity, the electricity plant and the water plant was in a no man's land. And basically, the Muslims controlled it. So if we would go out to turn it on, they would start shooting at it. And that's how we ended up without electricity or water. So to warm up in the wintertime, living underground, because we lived in, 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 in a climate just like Minnesota, very cold in the winter. My father would walk out of our bomb shelter and break twigs from the trees and bring them into the bomb shelter. And he would pour kerosene or mazout or benzene on them and light them with a fire. And we would huddle around the fire to warm up. And many nights, we had an agreement that whoever woke up first, because many nights would fall asleep around the fire trying to warm up, whoever woke up first would drag the other two outside and slap them on their face until they wake up. Because many nights we would pass out because of carbon monoxide poisoning, lighting fire underground with no ventilation in a little bomb shelter. And this became my existence. And we would listen to the radio, and in the beginning of the war we thought, I remember my father would say to me when we went into the bomb shelter, and you know, this little dumpy little place that my dad used for storage, and he would say, oh, it's a temporary thing, you know, it's just a week or two weeks, we'll be out, life will be back to normal. Because we would hear, my daddy would tell me, oh, America is going to come save the Christians in Lebanon. America and the churches in America are going to hear what's happening to the Christians in Lebanon and they're going to come save us. And then they would say, Britain is going to come save the Christians in Lebanon. France is going to come save the Christians in Lebanon. When they hear what's happening, nobody came and nobody cared. And as we started hearing about the massacres happening in the rest of the country, you see the Palestinians and the Muslims put their heads together and formed Jaish Lebanon al-Arabi, the Arabic Lebanese army. And they started massacring the Christians, taking over Christian cities and town. They committed massacres that were seldom reported in the Western media because the majority of the Western media was located in West Beirut, the area that Yasser Arafat controlled. And nothing came out of there that Yasser Arafat did not approve of. They would surround Christian cities and towns and walk in and massacre the people. One of the biggest massacres in Lebanon was the city of the Moor in the beginning of the war, a Christian city. They would walk into a bomb shelter. They would find the mother and a baby and a father hiding in a bomb shelter. They would take the baby, tie one leg of the baby to the mother and another one to the father and pull the parents apart, splitting the child in half. They would walk to our churches 
urinate and defecate on the altar and then torch our churches. The last lady that worked for me, I hired her because she was mentally disturbed. I wanted to take care of her and her family. And the reason why she was mentally disturbed is because they walked into her bomb shelter. They tied her son, 16-year-old only son, on her lap, held a knife to her hand and made her slit her own son's throat, then raped her daughters in front of her. These are the stories that went unreported in the Western media. Nobody in the world cared to hear and nobody in the world understood. And when the leftist Christians, when the Muslims would come to massacring them in these towns and the leftists would tell them, you can't massacre us, we marched with you, we represented you in courts, we pushed for your rights, we are on your side. And the Muslims would look at them and say, you are nothing more than useful idiots, you are no different than the other Christians, infidels. But by the time these people woke up, it was too late. And some of them who flew fled to come and hide in our town because it was the only Christian enclave left in South Lebanon. It was too late. We knew what our fate was going to be because we were surrounded by the Islamic forces trying to slaughter us because we were on the border with Israel. I come from a little town in southern Lebanon called Marjayoun, the Valley of Springs. If you have ever visited Metula in Israel on the northern border and stood on the border overlooking at Lebanon, my town is across the valley, across the border. We knew what our fate going to be because we heard of the massacres and we knew our days were numbered. And we knew to our front were the Muslims and the Palestinians who are waiting to slaughter us so they can be at the border with Israel. But we knew that to our back was Israel, the Jews. And we knew that of the two enemies, because at that time Israel was considered the enemy of Lebanon, we had no diplomatic relations in the 70s. We knew as Christians, if we go to the Jews and beg for help, the Jews are not going to slaughter us because we had more shared values with them than we had with the Muslims. So few people from my town went to Israel and begged for help. They flagged down an Israeli patrol and said, listen, we barely have 48 hours to live. If you don't come help us, we're going to be dead. So you help us, we'll be your buffer zone. It works out for both of us. Israel started coming in the middle of the night and bringing in ammunition, and bringing in support, and bringing in food for the military, and bringing bomb shelters to people. And Israel would take Lebanese Christians, anybody who can fight between the age of 15 and 40, and take them into Israel and train them how to fight. Because we learned very early on in the war that you can have all your professional degrees behind you on the wall. Your medical degree, your accounting degree, your law degree, your whatever degree. None of that will do you any good when you are faced with an enemy bent on killing you in the name of Allah. So Israel started to help. And Israel would come in the middle of the night. And this is how we lived for three years while no one in the world cared. I remember I was 13 years old. And a friend of ours from the militia, from our Christian militia, stopped by. And he said, Brigitte, I just want you to know that we heard on the radios today that the Muslim forces are planning a major attack against our town. And if I don't get to see you tomorrow, if we get killed tonight, I just want to wish you a merciful death. And he gave me a big hug and he left. And I remember as a 13-year-old, dressing in my Sunday best, in my Easter dress, because I wanted to look pretty when I am dead, knowing that there would be no one to bury me after they slaughter me. And I remember sobbing as my mother combed my long black hair down to my hips and tied a white ribbon in my hair that matched the white flowers in my blue dress. And I cried, begging her, I don't want to die, I'm only 13 years old. And there was nothing my mother could say to me. And we just cried. And I remember sitting in the corner of our bomb shelter and holding each other's hands and praying, my mother, my father, and I. And my father said to me, my father opened up the Bible and we were reading from Psalms, I shall walk into the valley of death and fear no evil. And my parents said to me, if they come to slaughter us tonight, we will create a distraction. You just run towards Israel and you never look back. You are a child, you are a young child, we lived a long life. Thank God I did not make that decision that night because that's the night when Israel came in physically into Lebanon and kicked out the Muslim forces and the Palestinians and set up checkpoints to save our lives around our town. And that's how we stayed alive. You see, I'm an only child to two elderly parents.
My parents were married for over 22 years. They couldn't have any children. My mother was 55 years old, and my father was 60 when I was born. As a miracle in their lives. Yes, wow. You better watch out. Don't let that gray hair fool you. <laughs> I'm a testimony. <laughs> I was a blessing in their lives. We went on to live in that bomb shelter like this for another five years until 1982 when Israel came in physically into Lebanon, entered Lebanon, all the way to Beirut. And the reason Israel entered Lebanon, invaded Lebanon all the way to Beirut, because Syria at that time, who had come to Lebanon as a peacekeeping force, started shelling Israel from Lebanon, using it as, Leb calling it Lebanese resistance. We Lebanese had nothing to do with it. So Israel, working with the Christian Lebanese in Lebanon, both in South Lebanon and in, in the capital in Beirut, trying to help the Christians take back their democracy and kick out the radical element out of the country. And Israel was able to come all the way into Beirut, kick out the majority of the Palestinians, including Yasser Arafat, where they kicked him out to Tunisia with his cronies. We came out of the bomb shelter and back to rebuilding our lives. For those of you who have not read my book, you should read the story about what happened to my life in a hospital in Israel when my mother got wounded. Because of time, I'm not going to share that story. But I may share it if I come back for night to honor Israel some other time. <laughs> but for the sake of time, I'm going to try to condense some information because I want to cover what's happening in our country here as well in the United States and why we and Israel are one together hooked in the hips when it comes to fighting radical Islam. I ended up moving to Israel in 1984 and becoming a news anchor for World News in the Middle East, working in Jerusalem in Benyanei Ha'oma. And uh, that's the big building where they hold the big concerts right next to the Hilton Hotel. For those of you who attend the Feast of Tabernacles, I used to come down from the fifth floor down to the uh, stage where they used to hold the Feast of Tabernacles every year. And that's where I worked. And that's where I worked from 1984 till 1989 as news anchor for World News, reporting on world events night after night. And as I reported on world events, I started realizing there was a pattern developing. Because no matter where the terrorist activity took place, and remember, this was in the 80s, where we started seeing a rise of terrorism and terrorist attacks around the world. No matter where the terrorist activity took place, the name of the perpetrators were always the same. Muslims, Ahmed, Muhammad, Hussein, Ali. The name of the victims were always Westerners, Christians and Jews. Terry Waite, Terry Anderson, Colonel Higgins, the Achille Lauro, the TWA, the Panam flights, and I can go on and on. As a matter of fact, in my first book, Because They Hate, titled Because They Hate, I go over pages upon pages, I list pages of all the years and all the attacks against the United States and Western interest that no one paid attention to. And I started realizing that what I used to think was a regional problem between a majority Muslim Middle East trying to kill or expel the minority Christians and Jews had become a worldwide problem. But the world was not paying attention. The world was not connecting the dots. The world lacked imagination. And isn't this exactly what the 9-11 Commission report said after 9-11? We lacked imagination. It's not that we did not know that Osama bin Laden wants to attack us. Osama bin Laden attacked the, in the previous eight years, Osama bin Laden attacked the World Trade Center. Uh, in 1993, the only difference between the two attacks between 1993 and 2001 were the buildings did not come down. They attacked our uh, embassies in uh, the Kubar Towers in Saudi Arabia. They attacked our embassies in Africa and Tanzania. They blew up the USS coal. And then they were so confident that we were so asleep that they came back and attacked the World Trade Center, the exact same spot again, and this time brought the buildings down. We lacked imagination. It's not that we did not know what our enemy wanted to do to us. Our, we are dealing with an enemy for the first time in history that is so open, so clear, so determined. They don't beat around the bush. They're very direct. And the more direct they are, the deeper we dig our head into the sand thinking, na 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 boo boo, I'm not going to listen. <laughs> And 
And the sad reality is that as long as Jewish blood was being shed on the streets of Jerusalem and Christian blood was being shed on the streets of Beirut, nobody in the world gave a darn. It wasn't until September 11th in the United States that the world woke up and realized, why do they hate us? What did we do to the Islamic world? Very simple words I have for you. They hate us. They hate us because we are infidels. Plain and simple. So what is driving this radicalism? Where is all this hatred coming from? A lot of people, especially when you listen to Al-Qaeda or the Palestinian, they say, well, we hate America, we are after America because America stands with Israel. Because of your foreign policy, that's why we attacked you on September 11th. If that is the case, then what is the mothership that is launching all this hatred against the West? In order for you to understand that, you have to learn a little bit about an organization called the Muslim Brotherhood, which you have heard something about associated with the Egyptian revolution in the last a few months, especially after Christmas. The Muslim Brotherhood is the oldest Islamic terrorist organization in the world, founded in 1928 in Egypt, with 70 offshoot Islamic organizations, including Al-Qaeda and Hamas. Now... The Muslim Brotherhood was founded in 1928. 1928? Israel didn't even exist. America's foreign policy supporting Israel? Israel didn't even exist for us to have a foreign policy. So why did the Muslim Brotherhood launch Al-Qaeda, Hamas, and 70 other Islamic terrorist organizations around the world today? The answer is because they launched a movement of radical Islam to revive the authentic radical Islam of the 7th century and bring back the Islamic Empire, the Islamic Caliphate, which Ataturk eliminated and ended five years prior in 1924. The Islamic Empire existed from the 600s until less than 100 years ago. Our knowledge of history is so slim and so small and so almost nil we do not understand what we're dealing with. We do not understand why our enemy is fighting us. They not only want the elimination of Israel, they want the elimination of our Judeo-Christian value system and of the West in general in order to bring back the Islamic Caliphate and conquer the world. Now, what are they doing and how they are doing it? The Muslim Brotherhood wrote a plan in 1982. It's a 100-year plan for radical Islam to infiltrate and dominate the West and establish an Islamic government on Earth. In the counter-terrorism circles, this plan became known as the Project. In the Project, they discussed tactics and, 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 and proposals as to how to infiltrate the West, how to set up non-profit organizations and maintain the appearance of moderation in order to advance radical Islamic agenda in the West. They talk about how to work with like-minded progressive organizations in the West that share a similar goal. They talk about how to get Muslim interns and political offices in all levels in the West to sway opinion. They talk about how to get Muslims on the boards of Republican parties and Democratic parties so they can have a voice in swaying the decision of that party whether conservative or liberal. They talk about how to get democratically elected Muslims into all levels in the Western government. They began implementing their plan in Europe in 1982. When you look at Europe today, Europe is no longer Europe. Europe has become Arabia. As I am speaking to you right now, in Europe, there are, in Britain alone, there are 85 Islamic Sharia courts operating parallel to British courts. I am sure if you would have stopped a British man 20 years ago on the streets of London and told him, do you know that 20 years from now, you're going to have a different legal system that's completely opposed to your democratic system, he would have told you, you're crazy, just as much as a New Yorker would have told you on September 10th, if you would have told him that tomorrow, 19 men with box cutters are going to bring down the World Trade, World Trade Center, attack the Pentagon, and kill almost 3,000 people. He would have told you, you're out of your mind. That's what's happening in England today. In France alone, there are over 725 no-go zones. These are Islamic zones where the police is even afraid to enter. Europe is no longer the Europe that you knew or your parents knew 20 or 30 years ago. Why are we so concerned in America? Because what's happening in Europe is nothing but a preview as to what's coming to the United States. 
They wrote the plan for the United States in 1991, the Muslim Brotherhood. Here is the plan. This plan was presented as evidence in the Holy Land Foundation trial in Dallas, Texas in 2007, the largest ever terrorism trial in the history of the United States against an Islamic charity where we handed down 180 guilty verdict, uh, 108, not 180, guilty verdict on terrorism t charges. Here is this plan. It says, Muzakkara Tafsiriya Lil Hadaf Al Estrategi Al Aam Lil Jama'a Fi America Shamaliya, written in 1991. What is so concerning about the plan, this is how to destroy America from within and how to set up an infrastructure in the United States, not a military infrastructure. We know Al-Qaeda is a military arm. We know those organizations want to attack us militarily. But this is the stealth jihad or the cultural structure to topple down the United States. The most important page of this document is the last page because it lists 29 front Islamic radical organizations operating in the United States as a front for the Muslim Brotherhood. The top one is ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. Many of you have heard of ISNA because they are now advisors to President Obama about Middle East policy. We not only have the Fox watching the hen house, we have the Fox inside the hen house talking to the president. And you wonder why the president is so eager to throw Israel under the bus or already threw Israel under the bus? It is shameful, shameful. The second organization is the Muslim Student Association, the MSA. The Muslim Student Association has more chapters today on American college campuses than the Democrats and the Republican combined. And we wonder where anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism is coming from? While we were asleep, our enemy has been organizing for years. The Muslim Student Association right now has such influence on American college campuses that if you are an, a, a pro-Israel speaker or a pro-America speaker, you will have to have security fit for a president to be able to deliver a speech on a college campus because of the Muslim Student Association and how organized they are and how hateful they are. Number eight on the list is NATE, the North American Islamic Trust. They control the majority of mosques in the United States. Number 22 on the list is the Muslim Association for Palestine, which later morphed into CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, which is a front for Hamas in the United States. They are now the ones who you see on television all the time talking about um, Middle East affairs. And they are the ones who are invited to the White House to the Iftar dinner and, and, and being catered to and speak at the Pentagon and at the State Department and everywhere else. This is what is so dangerous right now happening in America. It's not only the military threat that we are worried about. We know we are trying, they are trying to attack us militarily. But this is the insidious threat that we are worried about. And I'm going to touch on education and how they are attacking us with, with, with the education. Part of the Muslim Brotherhood, part of this plan, is how to start infiltrate every segment of our society in order to destroy America from within and create a generation that hates America from within. They have a media department, an educational department, a political department, a writer's department, uh, Islamic education department, intellectual think tank departments on every level. I'm going to touch now on our universities and how systematically they have tried this strategy to destroy our universities. I call our universities occupied territories because if you have a child in an American college campus right now, especially if it's an Ivy League university, you know exactly why I call it occupied territories. We have lost our universities. They're brainwashing our children. So how are they brainwashing our children and why? They started, the Saudis, because of the oil wealth, started pumping millions into our universities, setting up Middle East study department and political science departments, setting up Arab professors who are anti-Israel and anti-America to basically brainwash our students. They are using, this is how they're doing it, they are using a loophole in our laws called the Title VI program. The Title VI program was instituted by our government after World War II to educate American students about foreign languages and foreign cultures, especially those who want to get into the CIA and the State Department and diplomatic field so they can be an asset to our country. 
That's how the Saudis are able to use that program to funnel millions into our universities and set up this Middle East Study Department and Political Science Department. To give you a general idea of the infiltration of our universities, King Fahad of Saudi Arabia donated $20 million to set up a Middle East Study Department at the University of Arkansas. Five million donated to Berkeley's Middle East Study Department for two Saudi sheikhs linked to Al-Qaeda. Harvard received $22.5 million. Georgetown, $28.3 million. 11 million to Cornell, 5 million to MIT, 1.5 million to Texas A&M, 1 million to Princeton. Rutgers received 5 million share endowment, as did Columbia, who tried to lie to conceal the source of the funds. I can go on and on and on and on and on with many, 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 many universities. From the Ivy League to the community colleges and everything in between. We pump the gas and they pump poison into the hearts and minds of our future generation. And that's why we must become energy independence and stop our dependence on oil. People ask me all the time, Brigitte, why is the media so biased? I mean, my gosh, God forbid you're subjected to watching CNN, let alone CNN International, if God forbid you are on one of these cruises, because that's the only thing you're stuck watching on a cruise, CNN International. You know, you might as well be watching Al Jazeera in English. You know, my husband sits watching television with his shoe in his hand, ready to swing it at the TV set. I'm like, honey, it is so aggravating, but it is everything bad about America, as if nothing is good about America. And people say, why? Why are they so brainwashed like this? And I tell them, why are you surprised? Because for the last 16 years, ever since the Saudis started spending their millions of dollars into our universities, all these students who have been graduating out of our universities being fed a steady diet of hate and resentment against America and Israel are now the news anchors, the news writers, the opinion shapers, the bureau chief, the newsmakers. What else do you expect? They're basically talking the talking points that they were given in college. Except now they are the adults who are driving the agenda in our country and influencing millions of people. Now, it gets even worse. You know how it gets worse? The Muslims got together and they decided, you know what? The strategy worked so well on college campus. Why wait until the kids get to college? Why don't we start with the children in middle school? In 6th and 7th grade, they are so impressionable, they are young, they are ready to learn. Let's start then. So they started with the Islam course in middle schools in 7th grade as a part of the social studies program. Where students have to study Islam for three weeks, memorize and recite verses from the Quran, go to a mosque on a field trip, adopt Islamic names, and fast for Ramadan if they can to experience what it's like to be a Muslim. You know, when I started talking about this a few years ago, I actually discussed it in detail in my book, They Must Be Stopped, uh, which be, will be later available here. I see a lot of you taking notes. Save yourself from taking notes, and in the book later, you can get it. Just focus on listening. <laughs> they started with the children. Now, how did Hitler change society? Hitler said, give me your children. I'll change society in 10 years. And that's exactly what the Muslims are doing in the United States. When I started speaking about this, people would say, no way, we have separation of church and state, how could this be happening? So I thought there is nothing like show and tell. So here is the course. Here is the course about Islam. Yes, Pastor. The teacher instruction continues, dressing as a Muslim and trying to be involved will increase your learning and enjoyment. Finally, trying your best at all tasks will guarantee you an excellent grade and a more enjoyable time. The teacher is already dangling the great carrot in front of the children. Here are the Islamic names the students have to choose from. Abdullah, Khalid, Hassan, Hamza, Ibrahim, Karima, Khadija, Maryam, Noor, etc. Here are some exercises from the class. You know, it's a three-week course. And I'm going to read you an exercise because I'm going to make a point with this exercise. This exercise is about wisdom, wisdom cards, these are called. <coughs> They're teaching the students facts from fiction. And here is a fact card. A jihad is a struggle by Muslims against oppression, invasion, and injustice. 
Now, this may sound familiar to you, but here is why. Because these are the talking points of Al-Qaeda anytime Al-Qaeda issues a press release saying why they are fighting the Americans in the Middle East. Why? Al-Qaeda is fighting what? Oppression of the Islamic world, invasion of the Islamic world, injustice in the Islamic world. What do the Palestinians say when they're talking about why they're fighting Israel? Why they have jihad against Israel? What's the Palestinians' talking point? Have you ever heard Hamas, the latest Hamas press release? We will continue our fight against injustice, oppression, and invasion. Our enemies' talking points are now being taught to our 6th and 7th graders in public schools in the United States. Why are they doing this? Because these students 10 years from now are going to be in college and they're going to go into the workforce and they vote. And what, you, what opinion do you think they're going to have about Israel and our soldiers who are fighting in the Middle East coming back home? Well, of course they're going to kill you. You deserve to die because they are just protecting themselves. That's why they have jihad, because they're fighting you because you invaded them and you are not being just to them and you are occupying them. That's what's happening in our society. And here's the kicker. Here is something that the students have to analyze. Remember, public school. This is public school. Here's something that they have to, 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 to analyze. It is the Islamic salvation prayer or the Fatiha, which is the prayer that is said at the beginning of every prayer. It is the equivalent to the Christian prayer of the salvation prayer of I accept Jesus Christ into my heart as my Lord and Savior, etc. Praise be to Allah, Lord of creation. Now remember, we cannot sing Christmas songs at public schools. Okay? Can you imagine Pastor Hammond going in there saying, Praise be to Jesus Christ in public schools? Okay. Praise be to Allah, Lord of creation, the compassionate, the merciful, King of Judgment Day. You alone we worship and to you alone we pray. Guide us to the straight path, the path of those whom you have favored, which is the Muslims who accepted Islam and Muhammad. Not of those who have incurred your wrath, which is the Jews who refused Muhammad. Nor of those who have gone astray, which is the Christians. This is in public school. The students have to analyze this prayer. Can you imagine Pastor Hammond going to, to public schools and saying, we're going to teach the Bible, a course about the Bible for three weeks. Now you all students, if you behave yourself and dress like Jesus used to dress and you know, wear the, the Roman sandals, you'll get better grades. And you're going to adopt Judeo-Christian names like Michael and Sarah. And you're going to memorize and recite verses from the Bible. And you're going to fast to experience Good Friday so you'll know what it's like to be a Christian. And then I'm going to invite you to my church for a church service so you can experience like what it's a Christian. Now let's analyze the salvation prayer. Jesus, I accept you into my heart as my Lord and Savior. What do I mean by that? Can you imagine him teaching that in public schools? What do you think will happen? And you know how they're getting away with it? Because most parents do not sit with their children and watch what their kids are studying. We have a problem in our country. At the end of the course, and I just have to share this page with you, and I'm skipping through a lot of things, Pastor, because I want to make sure I honor the time and stick to the time. I can talk about these things, like, for another hour. But... <laughs> <laughs> you came here to get educated, baby. You're going to get educated. Here's how the course ends. They get all the kids in the cafeteria, and the teacher says, for the Islamic ball. And the teacher says, Assalamu alaikum, fellow Muslims. The kids are already Muslims. And they celebrate, and whoever was the best student, and at the end it says, um, the, they announce the winner of who was the best Muslim student in the class. And they say, uh, that's all we have time for, so until next time, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa allahu akbar, God willing, Allah willing, may peace be with you, and there is none greater than Allah Almighty. This is how the course ends. You know, we in this country have kept silent for a very long time about a lot of things happening in our country that we do not agree with. And I believe this is the time we need to take political correctness and throw it in the garbage where it belongs. <laughs> Ha <laughs> <Yeah. laughs>
<laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I am talking to the right people. Thank you, Pastor. This is the right crowd. You know, I travel the country and I speak to many people. And I know that we have a lot of things in America that are not perfect. No one's perfect. And just as people have our own shortcomings, every country has its own shortcoming. But I am sick and tired when I see people complaining about America, apologizing for America, seeing all the ills in America. If they are that upset with America, for God's sake, we'll give them a one-way ticket to whatever country they want to go to and leave this country to us. I am sick and tired. When I hear people say, I'm an African-American, and I'm Italian-American, and I'm a Vietnamese-American, and I'm a this and that American, I am nothing but an American. We must be only Americans. And this is why, as I started traveling the country and thinking to myself, am I the only person who sees this problem? Am I the only person who sees that we need to speak up in this country before it's too late? I understand what happens when people turn a blind eye to evil. When good people turn a blind eye to evil, evil dwells. Societies deteriorate. Apathy brings in tyranny. You know how I know? Because my life was affected by it. I lost my country of birth to radical Islam. I do not want to lose my adopted country, America. And that's why I'm doing what I am doing. People ask me all the time, Brigitte, why are you so passionate about this subject? I mean, my gosh, when you speak, the energy, the passion. And I tell them, you know how Holocaust survivors walk around with tattoos on their arms? I know what happens when people turn a blind eye to evil. Because I look at my scars of war every day when I take a shower. Scars seen and unseen because of my injury. And this happened to me when I was 10 years old. I know what happens when people say, say I don't care, it's far away, it's not going to happen to me. Yes, it will happen to you, because evil has a way of mushrooming and growing. And if you don't cut the head of the snake, it will reach you. It will get to you sooner or later. When people did not care about what Israel was fighting, they thought, oh, it's over there. They didn't care. Now it's here. We are fighting today the exact same enemy that Israel has been fighting for over 60 years. They're here. They're here now. And we must stop them now. And that's why... And that's why when I started traveling the country and I started educating people, uh, you know, I realized very quickly, people will come to me, they say, now that I am educated, what can I do? Give me something to do. And I realized very quickly, we can educate until the cows come home. Nothing is going to change. Education is important, but it is not sufficient. Education must be coupled with action. And that's when I launched ACT for America. Don't just love America, ACT for America. I realized there are millions of people across this country who think what I think, who feel what I feel, who want to see the changes that I want to see, but they are afraid to speak the way I do, because if you speak the way I do, people will call you racist and a bigot. I come from the Middle East. I look Middle Eastern. If anybody's going to accuse me of being a racist, they better be able to argue with me in Arabic, my mother tongue, before they can call me a racist. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I started traveling the nation speaking for Act for America. I'm proud to tell you that Act for America today is 170,000 members strong, 580 chapters nationwide. Yes, thank you. We have a full-time federal lobbyist on Capitol Hill, all day long talking to elected officials about what's happening in our country and educating them. We have our own national television show airing to 40 million homes across the United States and 190 markets. And I travel the nation speaking to people about how we can all work together in order to bring about change in our country. I realized the power of the individual in the United States is unbelievable and irreplaceable. We have something
something that most other nations do not have, and that is our Constitution and our Bill of Rights that give us the power to change the world. So I am here to share with you today how you can get involved, how you can become a voice affecting your community and our nation, how we can work together to not only defend and protect Israel, but how we can defend and protect the United States of America, and how we can do it democratically, respectfully, lovingly of our Muslim neighbors. We can pray for them, we can lift them up in prayer, we can honor them, we can respect them, but we can be wise in making sure that our Constitution does not get on, that the lines do not get crossed between the separation of church and state, that we still honor the foundation that our founding fathers have set up for us, while at the same time protecting ourselves. So that's what you're going to learn about tonight. And I'm going to invite Guy Rogers, the executive director of Act for America, to share with you some information about Act for America and how you can get involved. But before I introduce Act, uh, Guy Rogers on the stage, at this point of my presentation, speaking of our freedom, I would like to honor all our military and veterans who are in the audience. Please stand up and be recognized, every single one of you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Kindly, kindly remain standing. I have a message for you, all our veterans and our military. Kindly remain standing. I have a message for you. All of you, I want to see all of you up. Anybody who sat down, I'm waiting for you to stand up. Because I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for building a nation for me where an immigrant like me can escape tyranny and come here and live in this great nation. Thank you for building a nation for me, a beacon of light where people from all over the world can come here to be free. Thank you for building a nation for me where I can come and be all I can be as a human being, where I can accomplish anything I want to accomplish, where I can stand up and... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Kindly kindly remain standing I have a message for you all our veterans and our military kindly remain standing I have a message for you all of you I want to see all of you up anybody who sat down I'm waiting for you to stand up because I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for building a nation for me where an immigrant like me can escape tyranny and come here and live in this great nation Thank you for building a nation for me, a beacon of light where people from all over the world can come here to be free. Thank you for building a nation for me where I can come and be all I can be as a human being, where I can accomplish anything I want to accomplish, where I can stand up and speak without fearing for my life, where I can exercise my freedom of speech, my freedom of the press, my freedom of religion, and every other freedom I have. I know my freedom and the freedoms of everybody sitting down are built upon your shoulders and your sacrifice. I thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of millions of people around the world and in America who are not standing here before you today to thank you, to tell you face to face, we thank you, we honor you. You are not only my heroes, you are the heroes of millions of people. God bless you, one and all, and God bless the United States. States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I vow to you, I am building an organization that will always honor you, that will always lift you up, that will teach a new generation of America that you are our heroes and you will always be our heroes and you'll be treated as heroes. I vow to you that every place I am and every place members of my organizations are, you will be honored, you will be lifted up, you will be recognized. And now I would like... Okay.